Face Palm America. I'm Beowulf Rockland. FacepalmAmerica.com is where you can go to get more information on the show, listen to past episodes, and connect with us on social media. Here is a statistic I did not know. 2.5 million American citizens are incarcerated. And here's another. Uh, 6,300 of them happen to be incarcerated inside the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, the largest maximum security prison in the United States of America. One of these prisoners is the brother of Deborah Plant. She is joining us today. She's an African-American and Africana Studies scholar, chaired the University of South Florida's uh, Department of Africana Studies, and is the author of the new book of Greed and Glory. Uh, Deborah Plant, welcome to Face Palm America. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Y- you know, it's it's kind of a side topic, but I can't help but note that you're teaching African American uh, uh, studies in the state of, of Florida, and given the fact that uh, Ron DeSantis has just left the presidential race, it puts in mind the fact that he hasn't exactly been uh, partial to uh, African American studies in the state of Florida. Well. Um... Technically, I don't teach uh, in the schools here at, at the university here in Iran. Uh but I am a kind of a teacher because I'm still doing my work. I'm still doing my research and publishing and having public discussions about these issues. And you're absolutely right. Um, the uh, present, I guess, you person in that office uh, has... Uh, committed himself to what they call culture wars. And, uh, you know, culture wars, what do you have to do about them? Nothing except to stoke them. Uh, It's easier to do that than to deal with real issues that have to do with the quality of the lives of people in this this state. You know, I know people whose rent has gone up three, five hundred dollars. I know people who have, uh, within academe, who have left it, uh, those who are stressed out because there's such a hostile uh, environment that's been generated. These these culture wars do nothing except really pit us against one another. Right. They don't move us forward. And, um, and, and sadly, sadly, those who create or generate or stoke or uh, regenerate these culture wars, it's it's because of ambition to get to the next seat. It has nothing to do with whether or not there is, you know, real concern for the welfare of the people of this state or this nation. Uh, and if we, if, if as a public official, you can't really move us toward a more perfect union, then you're in the way of it. Yeah. And, and really, ultimately, those culture wars that you're talking about are a distraction from the fundamental problems and they go yes. as, as, as fundamental uh, as our constitution and and the 13th right. amendment to the constitution the one that supposedly ended slavery reads in part neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as punishment or crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the united states do you consider that phrase except as punishment for crime, to be the biggest legal loophole in the history of the United States? It's certainly one of them. Uh, And and I think, you know, as a loophole, there there are others, uh, but this one really undermines the very fabric of our society, right? Because America, we were taught America is the land of the free. But as you just, just expressed, how is that so when 2.5 million are locked up? Thousands are locked up every day because they don't have money to, to post bail. Uh, you know, how just is that? How fair is that? And if we're talking about the America that our founders and framers and freedom fighters uh, have tried to establish for us, then this is totally contradictory to, to that dream. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's problematic, and I think we have certainly opportunities to to address that, and I, you know, trust that we shall. I hope so, because it seems to me that the mass incarceration in America, um, 
essentially continues the, the slavery that, that 160 years ago was nominally abolished, if, if you look at it in terms of the, the raw numbers and, and indeed much of the conditions on, on the ground. A lot of things it, haven't changed. That's right. It it continues. This, you know, this is uh, what Brian Stevenson has pointed out, you know, uh, very clearly that slavery didn't end with the 13th Amendment. It simply evolved. I say simply, but there's nothing simple about it, which is why some of us can't see it uh, because it's disguised as, you know, some kind of law enforcement uh, justice and what have you. Uh, when this is not the case and so many people are enthralled in the system who are innocent and is everyone innocent? No, but is everyone uh, guilty of all of the crimes they've been charged and convicted with? Uh, even if people are in some way have committed some infraction or what have you, are we justified in treating people like property? Uh, are we justified in depriving them of their sovereign liberty for the rest of their lives? And and, and what are the nature? What's the nature of the laws? And who's making the laws? Exactly. And, what, and what purpose are they they making those laws for? Maybe by those lights, uh, they might technically be guilty, but are, are are they really morally guilty in a system that was designed for somebody else for somebody else's profit? Right. That's right. And uh, Alec Caracasinus makes this very clear in his book, uh, Usual Cruelty. And he talks about how uh, lawyers are complicit with this criminal punishment system. And as you point out, there are laws, but there are all kinds of laws. The question is, would laws uh, have a prosecutor decided that his office will pursue? You know, what will what laws will be pursued and who will be the target of that pursuit? And it's very much determined based on uh, racialism, uh, based on gender, based on uh, class, uh, and, and based based on uh, opportunity too as well. So it's like all of these things determine who's, who's going to be in the crosshairs of law enforcement, and uh, and and those who who enforce the law, you know, they they bring this bias with them, and uh, and we see that bias as it is represented by the faces behind these bars. Speaking of that, uh, tell us if you could the story of your brother and what happened to him. Well, my brother. My brother committed battery. My brother physically abused his fiance. He was arrested for that. Uh, he was charged with that, but because prosecutors can do what they do and do it with uh, basic immunity, he was charged with a whole lot more. He, as I said, committed battery and the prosecutor uh, presented him with a what they call a plea deal. And trust me, it's never a deal. Uh, and the deal was plead guilty not only to battery, but also to simple rape. And, uh, you know, you'll get only 25 years. If you don't, if you don't plead guilty to that, I will charge you with uh, aggravated battery, kidnapping, simple battery and aggravated battery, kidnapping, uh, and aggravated rape. The aggravated rape charge comes with a life sentence without the possibility of parole in Louisiana. And so the deal is take the 25 years and plead guilty to rape, simple rape, or if you don't, then I'll charge you with these other charges that's called stacking the charges. I'll stack these and send you away forever. 
my brother wasn't guilty of rape whether for 25 years or for life and he refused the so-called deal but because of the way the system works and because of a public defender who was i'll just say he didn't defend my brother um this this prosecutor was able to press his case and press it upon the minds and imagination of the secret jury. My brother was indicted by what they call a secret jury. He wasn't there. Secret jury. His lawyer wasn't there. Only the prosecutor, you know, there with the with the jury and pressing upon them his case. And then they said, yeah, he must be guilty. And wow. so he was convicted and sent to Angola uh being sentenced to life at hard labor without the possibility of parole. Wow. Secret juries in the United States of America. I don't That's think right. That's something that we think about a lot. And, and of, of, of course, you know, had his skin been a different color, you know, it's very likely that the "Quote unquote justice system would have dealt with him with a, a significantly lighter hand." Well, yeah, you're absolutely right, and there have been reports about this. You know, uh, a lot of times people get caught on the wrong side of the law. If, if, especially if it's like your first uh, infraction or, or, or first criminal case or what have you, if you've had no other criminal history. You probably won't even go to trial if you're white. Or what they'll do if you're white, uh, and and also if you have some money, then what they can do is, if you're being charged, it will always be at the lesser charge. Not at this extreme charge uh, that either you you did commit, but they can take it down, or you didn't commit in the case of my brother and charge you with that. So there is this differentiation uh, according to racialism and and according to uh, class, uh, which has to do with it's a money based system. So those things actually do make a difference. Slavery uh, was certainly a uh, a product of of capitalism, an, yeah. an, an effort essentially to to reduce labor costs as as much as possible and that was uh, certainly the case with the uh you know post uh, 1865 uh, sharecropping system and mm -hmm. and it's it seems to me uh, that's the case with the uh the carceral system as well would you say that the the carceral state is inextricably intertwined with capitalism absolutely absolutely i mean that's it that's that's the whole genesis of it which is you know goes toward the you know explaining or underscoring the, the main title of the book of greed and glory. Right. And the greed is how much profit can we amass uh, with, 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 with these expenditures or, or these investments in labor, particularly that, you know, we can do, do minimally. Uh, so to the extent that we don't spend on labor and labor costs, then you know this 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 is this increases our our profit, and this continues. You know, as you probably also well know, that that uh, state penitentiary at, at Angola is built on a slave plantation. Uh, the politics of that slave plant plantation continued with the politics of that state penitentiary. Yes. Yeah. And 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 yet. How do we push our leaders to 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 do better about this when when the vast majority of them are so closely tied and so largely answerable to the very same system which entraps millions That's of, right. our, of our fellow citizens every year? How do we do that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They all it's like a club. It's you know, it's 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 what I call and and, and I borrow from from uh uh Alec Caracasades, it, it is the criminal punishment system. And the thing about this bureaucracy is that everybody's got their hands.